This is the only technical slide I'll bring in. But here's how we work. In a moment of change, we get a challenge. We have to do something new. Let's say it's an email. Give, give a presentation, a high-profile presentation. You receive the email. The person who is going to do it is sick. You have three days. Ooh. This hits my rule book. Let's say my rule book is, I'm no good at presenting. This is a problem. We could have a rule book that says, yay, at last, a great opportunity. But let's imagine that we don't have that rule book. The rule book in my head says, this is a problem. I'm no good at presenting. Now, human beings, we survive. That's what we do. We survive. This is our great strength. It's also our risk when it comes to times of change. Because we predict the future. We know what will happen with our immense wisdom. So we predict the future. This will be a failure. I will, I will have a career problem when this happens. This kicks off some emotion. Oh, now I, I can feel fear. This must be bad. All I have done, all I have done is open an email. I haven't even left my desk and my whole hormone system, my physiology is changing because I'm predicting the future based on how things were yesterday. So the tiger has attacked. The heartbeat increases, the adrenaline flows, the voices of self-doubt. Decision, action, result, always. So I decide to do what I've always done. I feel fear, I move away from the danger. I do what I've always done and I, I repeat the results that I've always got, of course I do. Uh, and so this comes as a feedback into my brain and I know this is definitely how the world works. Or I have the courage to go out, to learn new skills, to get mentoring, to turn up humble, naked, asking for help. I don't know how to do this thing. You do, person. Could you help me? And you know what people say when you do that? They say, yeah, of course. They always say, yeah, of course. If somebody came to you humble and naked and said, I don't know how to do this, but I respect you, I respect you, would you help me? You would say yes. But here's a problem. You're now the top leaders. And in the industrial age, we were not supposed to be humble. And we were not supposed to turn up naked and vulnerable and say, would you help me? But if we don't do this, we can't move forward. So we have a challenge here. And, we, and then, of course, we will change the behavior. If you like the work of Carol Dweck coming out of Stanford on growth mindset, here's a growth mindset, here's a fixed mindset. She was evolving brilliantly with a great, great research, uh, an ancient concept. If you want, you could call this leaving uh, the, the comfort zone and this staying in the comfort zone. And by the way, the principles that we're speaking about today, these simple principles of change, you already know them. You've used them. They're not mine. I borrowed them from many people. If your name was Hannibal and you wanted to attack Rome from the north over the, over the Alps, it, you'd be using these ideas, right? So you know this. You've done this with your young people. You've done it with your children. You do it with the people in your teams. Today, my job is to invite you to be more rigorous in how we do it with ourselves. In the positions you are in, we have to know what it is we are aiming to achieve because everyone in this room is steering a super tanker. Nobody in this room is riding a bicycle on their own. So this is going to take us time. So it is critical, political leaders, it is critical, business leaders, that we know where we are going. Now we may have to adjust as the waters change, small adjustments, but we have the vision we have the strategy and we have the determination to execute. That may be near term or far term. In these disruptive times, it's probably both. Then we need to go in that direction every day. Oh, isn't this simple? This is too simple, you know this. It's not simple. This is where change stops. This is where change is defeated. Everybody always says, when, when you free dive, Jim, to 101 meters underneath the surface of the sea with nothing to breathe, the tiger must go crazy, right? The tiger is silent. At 100 meters under the ocean, I'm operating on a heartbeats per minute of around 30 to 35. I'm not releasing adrenaline and taking that up to 80. 
I'm very calm. The most important thing in free diving, mental control. The ability to deal with stress during pressure and change. The second most important thing, being able to deal with pressure. I will go to 11 times the Earth's atmospheric pressure in this environment. It is one atmosphere to outer space. When you land at the airport, you go through roughly one third of one atmosphere over 30 minutes in a pressurized container. The free diver going to 100 meters will go to 11 atmospheres in 60 seconds wearing a wet suit. And finally is breath hold, which is what everybody thinks is the real problem. No, breath hold is housekeeping. Housekeeping. You could all ho hold your breath with training for five minutes, which is where I got to. The tiger is not roaring at me at 100 meters. The tiger roars when I look at my schedule when I have the idea my agenda, my calendar, whatever your app calls, where you put your time planning. Decision, action, result. The action is everything, and the action is in your schedule. And when I look at my schedule, I do not have time to do new things. I'm a father, I own a house, I wear clothes, which means I have to do laundry on a, on a, on a, on a weekend, uh, I run a business, I run my own business, which means in the UK, and I'm sure in Sri Lanka, means that I'm a, I'm a, a part-time unpaid tax collector for the United Kingdom government. Welcome, welcome, people joining. Lovely to see you. Welcome, 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 welcome. I have no time to do new things. So when I look at my schedule, there is no space for new action. Ladies and gentlemen, change happens in your schedule which is why change doesn't happen, because you're busy people. Can I have a show of hands, all of you, who when you look at your schedule, have a lot of white space with nothing in it, and you find yourselves wondering on a Monday, I just don't know how I'm going to fill my week this week. I, I really, I, what shall I do? What shall I do? A quick show of hands, anybody who's in that situation. I love it, look at it. <laughs> that explains why you always look so calm, Michael. Change happens in the schedule, the schedule's full. Therefore, we have to take something out of the schedule. You don't want to do that. Look, this is the simple fundamental of change, I promise you, on a personal level. If you want to change for a train for a marathon, you're going to need to put time for training for the marathon in your schedule. You don't have any time because you have children, you have a family, you have a business to run. So our challenge is, how do we take things out of the schedule when we believe they are important? Answer, we have to go and push back. We have to speak to senior people and say, you have me coming to a meeting every week for four hours where I contribute nothing and I learn nothing. May I please not come anymore to this meeting? May I please deliver the important project to do with the sustainability of the infrastructure or the transport network that I'm working on just at the moment, or whatever it may be. This makes the tiger roar. Reputation and ego harm. Change happens in the schedule. Ladies and gentlemen, what do you need to take out of the schedule? What do you need to take out of the schedule? If you don't believe me, believe Gartner, the international research company looking at tech. I had the privilege of addressing their, their CTO, Chief Technical and Information Officer, forums in Europe this year, and the main, a big topic of conversation was what they're calling bimodal thinking. Two modes, same time. This month, I must keep the lights on. I must deliver for the customer, for my boss, for my family. I must also plan how I will deliver excellence in one year's time. Because change is so fast. If I wait for a year before I start thinking about that, I'm out. Especially if you're a CTO or a CIO. How many people hear voices in their heads? Anybody just, uh, I do hear, anybody else hear voices in their heads? Nobody, just me, okay, good. The voice I'm interested in is the voice that you just had a little, co oh, you're, you're there, good, I love it. The voice that you just had a little conversation with in your head, and you said to yourself, no, 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 I'm okay. I, I, I don't hear voices in my head, I'm okay. Or maybe I, no, maybe, no, maybe, no, that's the voice. Whenever you leave the familiar, comfortable, surroundings of your daily operation and go to somewhere new, you are going to meet this voice. So how we manage our heads becomes a critical core skill. May I ask for the team whether they could bring the chair up on stage, please? So the first thing 
you've got to do, uh, if you're going to be a jockey, let's just, let's take that example. First thing you have to do when you go to the racetrack, on the first day when you're going to ride on the television in a horse race, the first thing you have to do uh, once you've got changed is leave the changing room. This sounds simple, right? Leave the changing, it's not simple. Because inside the changing room, thank you very much, inside the changing room, there are, uh, it's warm and it's quiet and it's private, but outside the changing room, that's perfect, just there, thank you so much. Outside the changing room, there's a man with a big voice who's going to speak about everything that you do. There are TV cameras beaming these images to Hong Kong and Dubai and over the internet and satellite into Sri Lanka if you want to watch. And there's me, the guy who's only been riding horses for one year. And the voice in my head is saying, you have no right to be here and you have no right to walk out of that door. And I am listening. And you know this. You know this when you want to put forward your crazy idea in a meeting of senior people. You know this when you want to take your idea back to your masters in, 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 and mistresses in, in the United States or in China or in Europe, wherever, wherever HQ may be, if it's not based here in Sri Lanka. We know this voice. And whenever we change, we will meet this. Now, picture the scene. And we're going to come back and deal with how we, how we encounter this voice, which is the last thing I will speak about today. I'll speak about one more point. The the, the penultimate thing I will speak about. So we're not four tenths of the way through, don't worry. Though I will leave you with an app today uh, which has videos on all of the rules, but in the session this time we won't have time to speak about all of the rules. I will show you them all, and I'll speak about this one and one more, because those are the ones I wanted to focus on today, uh, given the brief that uh, Michael and the LMNC gave me for this session. So I'm dressed in the changing room, head to toe, in silk clothes. Maybe you've worn head-to-toe silk clothes, but in England we don't wear head-to-toe silk clothes very much. It's a little cold. It's, it's November. Uh, I, I, I've got no underwear on, no underpants, because jockeys do not wear underpants because it, they're too heavy. If you have a choice between some candy and a pair of Calvin Klein, you, you take the candy, right? So instead we have to have some support, of course, so, and some insulation. So all jockeys, not just me, all jockeys in the changing room wear ladies' tights for support which means that the jockey's changing room is the most bizarre visual experience of your entire life. We have lots of very small men, they, they, they're very thin, they're all reading a, a, a horse racing newspaper wearing ladies' underwear. It's a very strange room. I'm in this environment and I have to leave and I don't want to leave and the voice says, you have no right to be here, so I leave. I go outside. I have to get on the horse. We're going to use this as the horse today. Thank you, team, for bringing it on. We have done a full risk assessment for this, by the way. We're all okay. And um, I think. And uh, so you get out to the front. Now, the first thing I have to do is I have to take my horse past the grandstand. And the man there starts to talk about me. He says, I'm going down to the start, ladies and gentlemen, number 10, Air Gusta, ridden today by Jim Lawless. Jim is having his first ride here this afternoon. And in case you didn't see this morning's newspaper, he has only been riding horses for one year. So don't go to the bar, ladies and gentlemen. Things could be about to get very interesting out here on the track, which was not the encouragement I was hoping for. I get to the start. At the start of a horse race, now I don't know what I'm doing. I, I am so far out of my comfort zone here this first time, I cannot describe it. You know what they do? I mean, I practiced this at home, but I still wasn't ready for it. The first thing they do is they lock you into a coffin-shaped steel cage with half a ton of excited animal underneath you. This is the most dangerous part of the horse race, being locked in the cage with the semi-domesticated animal. This, not the fast part, the locked up part. This is where the accidents happen, for the jockey, not the horse. So I'm sitting there in there and I'm waiting. As soon as the last gate shuts, because it's so dangerous, you will not hear this, the starter of the race say, okay, are we ready? Are we steady? That's not how it's gonna go. All you are going to hear is, jockeys, and you've got to go. Now, the trainer of the horse will tell you how to ride that horse in that race. My guy said, get to the front as fast as you can and stay at the front until the very end. Said, oh, okay. <laughs> He's keeping it nice and easy for the new guy, right? So, so we go. I get to the front. I'm sorry about the view. I'm giving over this side now. I get to the front and... Um, uh, and, uh, and I'm coming in towards the finish, I'm still in the front. I'm thinking, I could win this race, but I shouldn't have been thinking that. I should have been thinking about these guys. Now, everything begins to change as you come into the finish. I didn't know this, because I've never been to this place before. 
When you start a race, all you can hear, let's just talk about your hearing, all you can hear are hooves and wind in your ears. You're doing 40 miles an hour, 60 kilometers per hour with nothing covering your ears. When do we do this? Uh, uh, but as you come to the finish, it changes. Suddenly you can begin to hear the noise of the commentator, which you can't hear at the beginning. You begin to hear the roar of the crowd, which you can't hear because you're too far away at the beginning. You ride into this noise. Everything changes. And I can see the finish. I think I'm going to win. But these guys are coming. They're coming. They're coming past me. One, two, three. I have to change gears on my horse to win. And you can change gears on a horse. And I promised we would do a little experiment with reputation and ego risk. You missed this concept that I explained it earlier, that how when we come to change, that one of the biggest challenges we'll face is, do people think I'm ridiculous? How, what is my risk of failing? Do I look OK? And we, don't, we can't control that because it's new. We haven't been there before. So I promised we'd do a little experiment. Here's where we're going to do it, on, on how you feel about reputation and ego risk. I'm going to invite you to, to, to come with me and learn how to change gears on a thoroughbred racehorse. You up for this? Oh, OK, one, two, three. Everybody stand. I love it. Yeah, first bit. The heartbeat, voices of self-doubt. Yeah, we're recognizing this. OK, feet about shoulder width apart on the floor. Turn your toes in. Bring your knees in together. That's nice. Now you push this out a bit and bring this down a bit. This is the hardest bit. Right. If you feel a bit weird, try doing this on the television in front of the, uh, with, without any pants on. It's, it's not good. OK. Now we're just going to start going with the movement of the horse, just going up and down with the movement of the horse. All right, now we're going to change gear. First thing, just get down a bit now, getting nice and low. Now just begin to push out in front, really stretch those arms. Come on, Michael. Now we're going to take one hand off. Wave that hand in front. Wave that hand behind. Oh, come on. A big round of applause. Thank you so much. Maybe we'll keep those images off, uh, off YouTube and the television. Huh? Thank you for playing. Thank you, gentlemen. Whenever we go into a new environment to do new things we have not done before, we will meet this voice. How do we deal with this? Do we look in the mirror and say, no, I'm writing the story of my life. I'm taming my tigers. No, 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 no. All of us in this room do important jobs. And we're receiving an evolutionary warning signal that has kept human beings safe for millennia. This deserves our full attention. What it does not require is our obedience. Whether we obey this or not is an intellectual response, not an emotional response. And we tend to move away from change governed by emotion not governed by intellect. Now, basic, basic, basic neuroscience. If we say we have three parts in our brain, we have mammalian and reptilian. Mammalian, reptilian, receives information, processes a danger, and tells us to run away. Stay safe. Adrenaline, hormone change. But we in this room also have a prefrontal cortex. So I have a part of my brain that alerts me to danger. And if I don't know what's happening in my brain, I might listen and run away. But if I do know what's happening in my brain, I can stop and think intellectually. The answer to whether I have the right to go and ride this horse is not in my stomach or my heart. It's in my head. So I have to stop and think, do I have the right? Flow chart, yes or no? Well, in my case, on this occasion, for six days a week, for 12 months preceding, I got out of bed at 5 o'clock. I was on a horse at 6 o'clock. I did that till 9 o'clock, and then I went to work because I had to feed my children. In the evening, I've gone for a five-kilometer run because I've got to lose weight, and I've got to get fit. Uh, speaking of weight, I've also been on a special jockey diet. I've been, uh, you, you, here's what you give up. You give up all bread. You give up all dairy produce. You give up all alcohol, all sweets, all cakes, all chocolates, all biscuits, anything they serve in the, United, in the, in the, in the airport network of the world, whoosh, gone. You can have a banana for your breakfast with a black coffee. You can have a small potato baked in the oven for your lunch with, uh, with a squeeze of lemon for flavoring. Mm. And for your evening meal, a little piece of chicken, grilled, no sauce. And you can have no carbohydrate, no potato, no pasta, no rice, because you had this at lunch. What you can have are some steamed vegetables. 
no source. Then your 5K run. I've been to the British Racing School in Newmarket. I didn't even know there was such a thing, but there are two racing schools in England. They've given me a two-day assessment on fast horses, slow horses, in the gym, a written examination on the rules and regulations of horse racing, and they have taken references from the jockeys and trainers who watched me ride, and they have given me a permit. I have earned the right intellectually to walk out of that door. So now it is a simple decision. Is the reward worth the risk? And does this human being have the courage to move into the uncertainty, the new environment, and grow? Ladies and gentlemen, what have you earned the right to go and do? If you look back, seriously, objectively, as an outsider, Look at your career and your achievements and your network and your qualification and the battles you've won and lost and grown from that bring you to sit in these rooms today. What have you earned the right to go and do? And if you wanted, what could you earn the right to go out there and do? And given the impact you can have upon millions of people, when will you begin? Because if this room moves on all the things you have earned the right to do, if through the LMNC you can move together on all the things that you are capable of changing, I'll steer us towards a close by a quick tour, and I'll give you details of the app. There is nothing to buy on my app, it is a gift. It has 50 coaching videos to take you through this process. You can use them, share them with your family or your teams, uh, and it has videos on all of the 10 rules, and it has this presentation. So behind a confidential code, this is recorded. It will be with you within one day, 24 hours, and you can share this then with your team, uh, at work, your family, at home, uh, your community, as you wish, of course, it is a gift. So. Rule number five. Ah, oh, okay, no, let's just... Now, how do we know if it's all gonna go okay if we go out there on the racetrack? Here's SpaceX landing their first rocket on its feet. Ah. So we've got this new phrase, haven't we? Don't fear failure. Embrace failure. Fail faster. Quick show of hands, those of you who like a good fast failure. Anybody in the room? Anybody who says to the team, get out there, deliver me some fast failure, everybody, because then we'll grow, right? Let's fear failure. Let's fear failure. We work hard when we fear failure. We get up early when we fear failure. But let's not fear making some mistakes, going into areas where we're not sure how it's going to work out. Let's tell everybody there could be some mistakes here. And then let's try and land a rocket on its feet for the first time in human history, which went wrong in January 2016. It didn't work, but they didn't fail. If they failed, they would have stopped the SpaceX program and Mr. Musk would have focused on Tesla. Conscious that Mr. Musk is having an interesting time today, but let's, 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 uh, let's, let's just leave that to one side. This is March. If I could show uh, the next video, please, the third video, that'd be great. March 2016. The first video is in January. Two months. Two months. And that is rocket science, ladies and gentlemen. So let's fear failure, but let's not be afraid to make some mistakes. Let's share the risk around our teams. Let's share the risk around our organizations. Let's share it, government with commerce, commerce with government. Let's go out together and make things happen, knowing that we might get a couple of things wrong and we'll be messy and we'll have to deal with that when it comes. Rule five, uh, ask us to recognize that the people who can help us are all around us. The tools to tame our tigers. Even if you want in the 21st century to listen to the, the Harvard professors sharing their knowledge, you can do that for a few dollars on Audible 
Bible.com. We live in incredible times. Previously, you would not have got that knowledge unless you passed all the examinations necessary and had the fees to go to Harvard, which is still a great thing to do, I'm sure. But now we have access to this information. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Rule number six. This is difficult. The best jockeys in the world, the best jockeys, the ones who really know how to ride a racehorse and win every time, they are in the bar at the racecourse. They are not riding the horses. These are big guys. They have never sat on a horse in all their life. They're drinking beer. They're watching the horse racing on the television. And if a jockey in the cold and the rain, who's been up since 4 o'clock this morning riding horses, makes a mistake in the opinion of our guru with a beer, then our guru will go and tell the jockey what the jockey did wrong. You in this room are exposed. You are not in the bar. Yes, if you are, we have a problem. You are on the track. You make things happen. And if we make transformation happen, we will be judged. The newspapers will judge. The television will judge. Our people will judge. And we have to be able to know that that's okay and that somebody will criticize us and that that's okay. We have to have the courage to do that. This core competency of transformation requires that we get used to the fact that somebody won't like us. How many people do not like the music of Mr. Justin Bieber? Ladies and gentlemen, a quick show of hands. If you do not like the music, there's a lot of Bieber fans, or I picked a guy who you don't know in Sri Lanka. I'm not sure. I'm sure Mr. Bieber's okay with this. If 30% of the world's population love his music, he's a happy guy, right? I'm sure 5% of you don't like me, and I'm sure I don't care. If we're going to go out there on the track and make things happen, somebody's going to write critical stuff about us. That's okay. Let's get used to that. Let's not fear that and let it stop us from doing our duty. So rule six, we've got to go out there. Rule seven, this is a learned skill. We practice this, we learn it, we get better at it. See if you can practice it today. Make someone in the hotel laugh. You think, oh, I'm not, very, I'm not very good at laughing, says the rule book, making people laugh. Oh, no, they might see me, they might judge me. See if you can do it. Because here's the thing, we go through the whole system, the, the uh, neurological system, the hormone change, everything. We can experience it, we can get used to it. Rule number eight is about time. The paper that we have been given to write our story upon. We write our story, decision, action, result. On what do we write this story? Upon time, ladies and gentlemen. And nobody in this room knows how much paper they have left. Any of us could be writing the last line on the last page. And sometimes people say, that's not very inspiring, is it? I think you should change that part of your presentation, make it more cheerful. I think it's the most inspiring part of this reflection we're doing together. What are we waiting for? Whose permission do we think is going to come one day and tell the most senior people in the business and political community in this nation that now you're allowed to make the changes? This is your time. That's why you are in this room. This is your time. What will you make happen? Rule nine is a reminder that we have to do the work. We have to do the work. So what are the habits? What are the skills, the disciplines, the basics required to be a jockey, to take the free dive record, to deliver excellence in your area of leadership? And if those skills are not in place, go learn them. If you don't know how to inspire people through times of change, go learn how to inspire people through times of change. It's a learnable skill. You've done the hard skills. What is it we need to add on? Let me please just invite you to take a photograph of this slide. This is the code that you will need to access the LMNC area on the uh, Taming Tigers app. Uh, you have an invitation there to download the app. It's, it's as I mentioned, entirely free. And there's nothing to buy on there either. It's a gift uh, to say thank you for the invitation and thank you for your kind attention. And to try and help 
these principles live on uh, with you and with your communities after today. Uh, that, that slide will disappear in five, four, three, two and a half, two, one. Well done, sir. If you could help me, please, gentlemen at the back, by taking the volume down on this last video, which if we could play would be great, and by keeping the volume very, very low. Thank you. I'm going to invite you to come free diving with me. This is the day when I took the record. I, I failed the day before. Well, I didn't fail, did I, because I succeeded. I, I, I made a mistake the day before, and I was underwater for three minutes and 40 seconds. Uh, this time I was under for two minutes and seven seconds, and it was successful. This video is in real time, so if you wish to hold your breath, uh, can come with me? You can. Uh, if you start feeling strange, please breathe, breathe, breathe. There's not a competition. Let's stay safe. Stay safe. There's a decision that I have to take at the beginning of this dive. And that decision is I am now going to 101 meters. This is happening. Unless there's an emergency, in which case we come back very quick. This is not a macho sport. It's like mountaineering. If it looks dangerous, come home. Be with your family. We try again tomorrow. There are many chances to get it right, only one to get it wrong. But I have to decide I'm going to 100. I cannot think I'm going to go to 80 meters. And when I get there, I'm going to stop at 80%. I'm going to have a little think and see whether I feel like it today. Because if I stop and ask myself that emotion-based question at 80% of my journey, I am likely to say, let's go home. I will find a reason to quit. And we have to commit to complete. We have to stay the course, go through the hard times, and finish or we do not deliver change. Now at 80 meters, I might want to quit because I am under nine times the Earth's atmospheric pressure. This means that my lungs have been compressed down to the size of my, of my fist. Currently, like yours, my lungs occupy my entire rib cage. This is entirely healthy. We're built like dolphins. Our bodies will do this. You need to stretch a little bit if you're coming straight off a desk to get ready, but you can do it. My, my uh, diaphragm, the muscle that separates my stomach from my chest, has been brought up high into my chest cavity. And this means that my stomach has been pulled in by the vacuum. And that means that at 80 meters under the ocean, ladies and gentlemen, you look wonderful. Right? If only we could stay like this, but we can't. I have to know I'm going through that all on my own. There's no safety diver, as you saw. It's high, too high risk for a scuba diver at 100 meters. It will take her three hours and five tanks for her to come home. But I cannot achieve my goal unless I commit to going through that point. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the same for all of us. We have to know that this point is coming. We have to know. Oh, um, forgive me if we could go back to the last slide. Thank you. We have to know that this point is coming. We have to know in advance. And we build the skills. And we build the resilience. And we build the friends. And the political network. And the, and the consent back from our leadership. And the contingency on the PL. Whatever it is we need to build to enable us to ride that difficult period, we have to put in place. Because if we do not, that period will come. And we will downgrade our ambitions. Or we don't quit. That's too bad for our reputation. We just tell everybody, well, market conditions, political conditions, meant that I couldn't deliver 100%. But I delivered a wonderful 30%. Aren't I good? And that's just about enough to pay the mortgage, to feed the family. We're not living in a time, and as I feel you, in a community where we're doing this to feed the family and pay the mortgage. This collection of people have something far bigger to do. Ladies and gentlemen, you are writing the story. The story that you write will impact millions of people who need your support. What is the next chapter that you will write together? Maybe even using the offices of the LMNC to come together to do it. But what is the next chapter that you will write together as you leave this room? 
It's been an enormous privilege to be invited to spend time with you. I'm exceedingly grateful both for the invitation and for your very kind attention. I wish you a wonderful evening and a hugely successful time ahead. Thank you so much. Goodbye.